Greetings students and welcome back to another video on quantum mechanics. In this lesson I'm going to define commutators and talk about the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of operators. So let's begin. Suppose I had two operators a hat and b hat. Their commutator, which is just denoted by putting a hat and b hat in these square brackets, is defined as a hat b hat minus b hat a hat. Intuitively you can think of a commutator as a quantity which tells you the extent to which a hat and b hat commute. If a hat and b hat commute, if the order in which they're applied doesn't matter, then a hat b hat and b hat a hat are equal, and so their commutator is just zero. If they don't commute, then the commutator isn't zero, and the closer the commutator is to zero, the greater the extent to which a hat and b hat commute. Now there's also something called the anti-commutator, which is denoted using braces instead of square brackets. And it's just a hat b hat plus b hat a hat. Intuitively, the anti-commutator describes the extent to which a hat and b hat are anti-commutative, kind of like how the commutator describes the extent to which a hat and b hat are commutative. Anti-commutative, by the way, just means that swapping a hat and b hat gives the negative result. Now the anti-commutator isn't used as frequently as the commutator, but it's still worth defining because there is one notable place it'll show up, at least in the next video. Anyway, now that I've defined commutators, it's time to look briefly at some of their properties. Again, I'm not going to be proving these properties because this isn't a linear algebra series, and these properties are also very easy to prove. I encourage you to do it yourself. For now though, I'll just be putting them up here for reference. The first property is that the commutator of a hat with itself is zero, and this is pretty obvious since a hat squared minus a hat squared is zero. The second property is anti-symmetry, which is also relatively obvious from the definition of commutators. All it says is that if you switch the order of the commutation from the commutator of a hat and b hat to the commutator of b hat and a hat, you'll get the opposite result. The third property is linearity, so the commutator is a linear operation. The fourth property is that the Hermitian conjugate of a commutator involving a hat and b hat is the commutator of the Hermitian conjugates of b hat and a hat. Now you might be confused, how can you even take the Hermitian conjugate of a commutator? Well, that's because if you think of a hat and b hat as matrices, which is one way of expressing operators, if you think of them as matrices, then obviously if you multiply two matrices and subtract them, then the result a hat b hat minus b hat a hat is also a matrix. So this means that in general, if a hat and b hat are operators, then their commutator itself is also an operator. So that's why it makes sense to take the Hermitian conjugate of a commutator. Anyway, let's go to the fifth property. The fifth property states that the commutator is distributive. And of course, we can extend this distributive property to large numbers of operators as well. Property six is called the Jacobi identity. All it says is that the sum of these large commutators, which each involve a bunch of small commutators inside of them, is zero. The seventh property states that the commutator of an operator with a scalar is just zero. In other words, operators and scalars commute. The eighth property that I'll very quickly mention here is that the commutator of two Hermitian operators is anti-Hermitian. And property number nine is that the anti-commutator of two Hermitian operators is Hermitian. So now that we've covered the definitions and properties of commutators, we can go ahead and talk about eigenvalues and eigenvectors. You might already know what these are, but I'll review them anyway. The quantum mechanics context will be useful for future videos. Anyway, let's start with an operator a hat. The eigenvalue of a hat is then a complex number lambda, which satisfies the following relationship. In this case, the vector psi is called the eigenvector, and this whole equation relating a hat, lambda, and psi is called the eigenvalue problem. Solving this eigenvalue problem results in solutions for the eigenvalues and their corresponding eigenvectors. Now in this video, I'm not going to solve examples of eigenvalue problems since this series already assumes you know basic linear algebra. But later on, should an eigenvalue problem arise in quantum mechanics, and believe me, it will, I'll be sure to start off slowly in case you need to refresh your memory.
Now for the remainder of this lecture I'm going to state a couple of properties related to eigenvalue problems, then state a bunch of eigenvalue theorems without proof. And finally I'll wrap up by stating the second postulate of quantum mechanics. So let's start with the properties of eigenvalue problems. The first property involves the eigenvalue problem on the identity operator. For the identity operator, since the identity operator just spits out the same vector it operated on, the eigenvalues are always 1. And the eigenvectors are every single vector in the vector space. In other words, there are infinitely many eigenvectors. Now because the eigenvalue lambda i corresponds to more than one eigenvector, we call it a degenerate eigenvalue. The second property is that if I had an operator a hat which satisfied this eigenvalue problem, then an operator involving a function on a hat will satisfy this eigenvalue problem with the same eigenvectors but the eigenvalue changed according to the function capital F. So that should do it for the properties. Now let's talk about some theorems involving eigenvalues and eigenvectors. The first theorem states that the eigenvalues of a Hermitian operator are real and their expectation values are also real. The second theorem states that the eigenvectors corresponding to different eigenvalues of a Hermitian operator are orthogonal. In other words, if lambda1 and lambda2 were distinct eigenvalues of a Hermitian operator A, whose corresponding eigenvectors were psi1 and psi2 respectively, then the inner product of psi1 and psi2 is zero. The third theorem states that the eigenvectors of a Hermitian operator form a complete set of mutually orthonormal basis vectors. And this complete basis set is unique if the operator has no degenerate eigenvalues and infinite if there are any degenerate eigenvalues. Now that seems like a lot of complicated words, so let me break it down for you. A mutually orthonormal complete set just means that the eigenvectors I get from a Hermitian operator will all be orthogonal to each other, they'll have a magnitude of 1, and they'll be able to describe any other vector in the entire vector space just by linear combination. Theorem 4 states that if A hat and B hat are both Hermitian operators that commute, with A hat having no degenerate eigenvalues, then every eigenvector of A hat is also an eigenvector of B hat. Theorem 5 states that the eigenvalues of an anti-Hermitian operator, in other words an operator equal to the negative of its Hermitian conjugate, the eigenvalues of an anti-Hermitian operator are purely imaginary and so are their expectation values. And finally, theorem 6 states that for a unitary operator whose Hermitian conjugate equals the inverse, the eigenvalues are complex numbers with a magnitude of 1, and that's why it's called unitary. The eigenvectors are also orthogonal to each other as long as the unitary operator doesn't have any degenerate eigenvalues. Now, that should do it for our eigenvalue problems, but before I end I want to focus a bit more on theorem 1b, which I'll copy-paste over here below. It says that the expectation values of Hermitian operators are real. Now let's compare this to a measurable quantity like position. Suppose I had a particle that was moving around, and suppose I took several measurements of that particle's position as it moved around, and suppose I labeled those measurements as x1, x2, x3, and so on. Since I've collected a bunch of measurements, I can find the expectation value or the mean of the particle's position with this simple calculation. Now this mean, this expectation value, is obviously a real number. It can't have an imaginary component that clearly wouldn't make any sense. The same reasoning applies to any other observable quantity, like momentum. If I took multiple measurements of the particle's momentum, p1 through p5, the expectation value or mean of those measurements is once again a real number. So the expectation values of actual measurable quantities of observables like position and momentum, the expectation values of those quantities are real. But the expectation values of Hermitian operators are also real. So is it then possible that measurable quantities, that observables, are related to Hermitian operators? Yes it is. In fact, this is the second postulate of quantum mechanics, that to every observable in classical mechanics there corresponds a linear Hermitian operator in quantum mechanics. So to give an example, the position quantity x in classical mechanics has a corresponding Hermitian operator x hat equals x in quantum mechanics. 
Similarly, the X momentum in classical mechanics has a corresponding Hermitian operator, Px hat, in quantum mechanics given by h bar over i times the partial with respect to x. h bar, by the way, is just Planck's constant h divided by 2 pi. So this second postulate, which is one of the statements on which quantum mechanics is based, is taken from the fact that Hermitian operators have real expectation values. Anyway, that should do it for the lecture. In the next video, I'm going to prove the generalized uncertainty principle. I'd just like to finish off by thanking the following patrons for donating at the $5 level or higher to my Patreon. If you would like to become a patron, I've put a link to my Patreon account in the description and you can support me there if you wish. So that's it. If you enjoyed the video, feel free to like and subscribe. This is the Faculty of Khan, signing out.